Although we are sharing this year's events virtually, the festival is based in St. John's, Newfoundland and Labrador, and we respectfully acknowledge the land on which we gather as the ancestral homelands of the Beothic, whose culture has been lost forever and can never be recovered. We also acknowledge the island of Uktahumguk, Newfoundland, as the unceded traditional territory of the Beothic and the Mi'kmaq, and we acknowledge Labrador as the traditional and ancestral homelands of the Inuav Ntsinan, the Inuit of Nunatsiavut, and the Inuit of Nunatuhavut. We recognize all First Peoples who are here before us, those who live with us now, and the seven generations to come. As First Peoples have done since time immemorial, we strive to be responsible stewards of the land and to respect the culture, ceremonies, and traditions of all who call it home. As we open our hearts and minds to the past, we commit ourselves to working in a spirit of truth and reconciliation to make a better future for all. Hi there to both of you and to whomever may be tuning in to catch this seen and heard chat. Um, my name is Kumbi. I use she, they pronouns. I'm coming in uh, from Echabukta Catchet Lake, Nova Scotia. I've got my I've got my little cup of tea here. I'm ready for a cozy chat. Uh, first, I'll introduce our two experts. Um, thank you both so much for joining us today. So first, we have Osas. Iwaka Smith, who is a publicist and public relations officer based in the NFB's Halifax office. She is an a a IABC award-winning communicator with 12 years of experience in public relations and communications, also a filmmaker, also so many other things in her bio that I'm trying to skim through and list, but I think they'll they'll come out through our conversation. Uh, do you wanna say hi, Rosas? Hey. Uh, and we also have Brenda Lieberman, who is a festival director, co-founder, and lead programmer for the Calgary Underground Film Festival and lead programmer for the Calgary International Film Festival since 2007. And again, same thing. I'm scrolling through these bios and I'm like, oh, and that's good and that's important too. And that's so impressive. Uh, but I think it'll come out in the chats. So let's get right into it. Um, I should also maybe say I am a filmmaker and actor, and so I'm really excited to ask you these questions, not only for the folks tuning in at home, but for myself. <laughs> I have a, a film that we're going to camera in quite soon, and so I think all of these questions uh, will be very helpful for me, actually. Uh, so the first question, I'm thinking if we can just start at the very, very beginning, how early should someone start preparing for marketing and publicizing their film? Well, if I was to start uh, from my perspective, I think it should be right when they're working on the budget and the application for their film. Um, we find with a lot of films and filmmakers, it becomes an afterthought. They've spent their budget already. They didn't think about festivals. They weren't thinking about those steps that they could be taking early on. And I, I think it's it's really important to be thinking about it right when you're working on your anything to do with the film and, um, and make sure that you budget for it because more and more film festivals are not um, providing waivers to filmmakers. So anyways, I digress on that, but I do think it has to be something that has to be at the very beginning when you're putting your whole package together and be thinking about um the long game with it yeah thanks that makes a lot of sense osas would you agree i completely agree and like brenda said oftentimes it's an afterthought like oh we have to do publicity oh there's marketing <laughs> information um definitely if you can um including during the um the onset do that add it to the budget um, in your budget, have something for public uh, for publicists. Uh, when I make films, I do that. Um, but you know, even going as far back and just like thinking when you're making your project, where do you want to see it, right? Like, do you want to go to festivals? Are you making it for schools? Are you making it for what platform? What audience, right? Um, because that also affects your publicity as well. So from the beginning, think of where your film wants to go and um, and have that in the budget as well for public system marketing and promotion very, very early on. 
That's great. So yeah. you both sort of mentioned that, sorry, that that budgeting piece. How specific do you need to be with that budget? Is It's probably different from project to project, but would you have a range of, of budget that you would put aside for that? I mean, I would probably start with skimming through Film Freeway and taking an average of what the different um, entry fees are going to cost you for a range of different film festivals. And, you know, keep in mind that you, you're going to have to throw a ton out there to get a couple hits, if any, like it sounds discouraging, but you can't just pick one or two top festivals yeah. that also charge the most. You really need to, you know, it might be a question that we're going to get into later, but I would take a look at some average pricing and I would um, double or triple the amount of festivals you think that you would be applying to to get your film out there uh, for sure. And in terms of publicists, I know some films will go, you know, really high and hire, you know, you know, a, a career publicist. And for some films, that's potentially the right direction for them. For other films, you might want to hire somebody with communications and publicity experience in your city who you know, can still dedicate time to it, but would be less expensive. And I don't, you know, you know, that would be working with who you know, um, but having somebody who's got the experience of even helping you draft some materials, because again, not knowing where all the questions are going to go, but there's a lot of materials that I think you also have to prepare when you're thinking about your marketing and publicity at the beginning, you know, do you have, put in some money for a graphic designer to make your press kit or your package, like right. just little bits of things that you're gonna get asked about if your film gets accepted and you need to be prepared in advance. So just marketing and publicity is gonna be all those things. So the submission fees, the publicist, your press kit, that's um let's just talk for a second about that press kit um is that something that you should be pulling things for kind of from day one like you know first day of principal photography are you trying to take those pictures for that for that day exactly that exactly and that's why i said earlier you have to really start thinking about all your publicity that from the very, very beginning, because as you're in, uh, in produ uh, pre-production and production, those back uh, behind the scene footage, you should definitely be grabbing those, uh, the press kit, what is in your press kit, uh, your press release, your, your behind the scene shots, your trailer, uh, and all of those little bits. Uh, you don't want to be at the end of your film and realize, oh my gosh, I didn't grab any BTS, any behind the scene shots. And, uh, you know, budget for a publicist, budget for a behind the scene photographer. Um, you can get those people at a really fairly uh, uh, good range, um, 400 bucks a day or so. Um, so definitely start grabbing those things from the very beginning because you don't want to wait until when you get a call from the media and realize, oh no, I don't have ABC ready. I don't have that and this. And the, the turnaround time for the media can be very fast when they want something, you know, they want it quickly. And when you're booking an interview, it, things happen so fast. So as early as you can uh, include publicity in your, in your planning and get those collateral materials as early on as you can as you're uh, going through the process. And I just want to go back to the topic on the budget, like how much should you gauge for a publicist? Um, it just really depends. I like to go back to what I said earlier, like what is your vision for your film? What is your vision for your project? Do you want to do you want to go to film festivals? Um, if you do, great. What does that look like? Um, do you want to focus on distribution? Like after it's all done, you want the library, the local library to acquire it. Um, if you want the school system to acquire it, or do you want a streaming service to acquire it? So what does that mean for publicity and so on and so forth? So um, if you're going to Sundance, for example, right, or the big leagues, um, then you need a, 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 a high level publicist to really support you because there's a lot of work that goes with that and a lot of movements and things you have to get done. But if your your goal is, you know, the, the big ones are uh, the TIFF, the Calgary, the Vancouver, the, uh, the, the Finn in Atlantic, 
um, those big Canadian ones. So you need a really, a really strong publicist. But if your vision is not for those big leagues um, uh, uh, spaces, then maybe a uh, 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 an entry level publicist or a communications person um, can can do that work for you. Yeah, and I actually had another point just to jump in on in terms of materials. Um, and, and maybe sometimes I take for granted what I think is obvious, but the when you, when you have photography on set, like still, stills photography, something that a lot of filmmakers forget, and this again, when you're doing it as part of the film production and you should be thinking about it, make sure that you're getting uh, high quality, high resolution production stills too that sell your film. Because, you know, often, uh, you know, we'll be looking for materials for a film once it's selected. And a lot of filmmakers, if they've not, if this is their first film or their students, or you're not sure what people are asking for, they will just send us behind the screen photos, boom shots, crew photos, the, those aren't what we're looking for. You have to think about, I mean, those are nice for us to see once in a while, you know, who the director is and who the crew is, but what the film festival is gonna be ultimately looking for as an end is what, you know, think of like the still photography shot that's gonna sell and captivate the audience to see your film. And we need ones that aren't too dark. We need high resolution. We need, you know, we need to be able to see what's in the photo. And um, sometimes it's a real challenge for a festival to be able to kind of pull those images from the filmmaking team. So as long as filmmakers know that those are the photos that we're gonna be looking for and having some a couple to choose from would be ideal. Yeah, that's really interesting. I have to admit, I think in the past, I've kind of assumed I could just, you know, take a still from the, the film or something, but it is a totally different quality level to get that production still. Um, that's a good hot tip. <laughs> yeah, especially, you know, like right now, people are doing a lot of things online, but if people go back to printed guides and stuff, you know, and, and still the high resolution, if, if media asks, especially locally, uh, we always get asked for production stills for different films. So you just want to have, if you've got good ones, the festival is going to choose it as the ones they send to the media or that they, you know, profile a shorts package with or whatever. So. Right. And I think you both kind of touched on this because it, it is, there is so much involved that really the ideal situation is to hire someone who can kind of think about that whole strategy and and put all of that together but if you are on a on a lower budget how stylized or creative do those pieces need to be is, is it enough to just sort of have some great pictures have a good you know log line synopsis it's kind of the like the basic package or do you would you really encourage people to to get more creative with it or think bigger I mean, I mean, for me, from the festival side of things, we just want, we really just want the details. It doesn't need to be a fancy uh, PDF um, with everything mixed in together. Like, you know, there's some really slick ones and don't get me wrong, we love them. But, um, you know, when we go over, um, I don't know, we have sessions all the time with local filmmakers. And when I look at the press kits, you know, we want to see certain things. It could be a Word document, you know, things that are easy to copy and paste so that the letters aren't all jumbled up when you copy and paste it. Sometimes happens in different um, fancy documents that are made for PDF, but uh, you know, we want a log line, you want a short synopsis, you want a long synopsis, so a variety. Uh, we wanna, some filmmakers, what they'll do is create like a Dropbox link or a Google Drive link to just give you two with some files and you know, we really just want to recommend two to three tops for photos. Like, we, you know, thinking about everyone's hard drive spaces or access to materials, like, you know, sending folders of hundreds where we have to sort through and filter what we're looking for uh, mm -hmm. is really time consuming on staff. So, uh, you know, just focusing in on the key things, we look for the variety of synopses for uh, various things. So different Festivals are gonna have different purposes, but one-liners, uh, two-liners, the short and the long synopses, those could be used in different, um, like all sorts of variations, whether it's like 
your website, a print guide, uh, the media wants a quick one liner, you know, so having those variety or the programming team or copywriters in a festival are going to be rewriting your stuff for you. And again, some filmmakers may or may not like that approach and having those materials prepared at the beginning for a festival is going to be helpful to kind of make sure that your vision is what's coming through in the in the copy. Absolutely. That totally makes sense from a film festival. I'm curious, Osas, if that from the, the from the press side, if that is still still the case. Yeah. I like to I I think it would be helpful for people to think about it this way. The items don't have to be fancy and all of that stuff. It's just noise, right? Like, especially when it comes to the media, it's just noise. Um, a nice quality, high resolution photo is awesome. You don't need to put any squiggly lines or anything like that around it or anything like that. Um, how I, I would like for people to think about it is every single item you put out there by your project tells a story, right? So pick your top three photos that you want to share. What, what message, what stories are those photos conveying about your project, about your film, about the characters, about the journey and what you're trying to tell? And package it in a way where the media can just grab and go. That's my, that's my thing, like grab and go, grab and go. Just simplicity is the key. Make it simple for them. They are very busy. They have a lot of stuff going on. Their the tension span is very very short and the turnaround time again is very very fast or can be fast at times so make it simple for them have everything packaged together in one space um, the short synopsis is in one in one document the long version and the different depending on the local community or the local media you're targeting if you're targeting Edmonton or Vancouver or whatever the case may be have it all in one place along with your photos the trailers for example, if you're if you have it within your budget for your film, maybe create on your website on the film website, create a film a website for the film, and then uh, a page of that website could be uh, for the media like uh, the press kit. So where the media can just go, it's public. They have access, no passwords required, no login or anything required. They just go. You send them the URL. They go, they grab whatever photos and download whatever materials that they need from there about your project. Or like Brenda was saying earlier, um, if uh, a website is not within budget, you can do things like uh, shared um, uh, spaces like uh, Google Docs or, or, or um, things like that. So yeah, it's not about the shiny stuff, but it's about the quality more or less and just making it very simple and seamless for the media to access. Right, okay. Thanks. Yeah. I, I think I, oh, go for it. Go ahead. No, finish your thought. No, no. I was just going to say, I, there's a lot of the, the press and package stuff and I have more questions for that later. And I wanted to get back to the submissions, but finish your. Well, actually, I mean, that kind of led me to a few more thoughts that we didn't cover on in terms of marketing <laughs> and your package package. Um, but Things that filmmakers tend to forget that festivals and media like, and I think is important from the beginning is, is looking um, at all even digital platform materials. So for example, website, you know, are you gonna have a website? And if you are, have it updated, uh, you know, make sure that your IMDB profile is updated. You have the right year, like don't put the year that you're working on your film you want the year that the film is being released in so it looks okay. fresh and it's new. Your first festival, if it's in 2022, it's a 2022 film. You don't want to put 2020. There's all these sorts of things that people are going to start looking for. They're going to look at to see if you've got any social media. I think these are things you have to think about in the beginning too because as soon as you start marketing your film and getting into festivals, you know, you don't want too many things to be an afterthought. Uh, same with your Facebook profile. So if you're going to have it for the film, make sure that you've got somebody keeping it updated so everything is current and it's going to be a useful piece of information for both the media and the festivals. And, you know, people will pull things. And, and then too, like, if you're going to send a screener link to the media to watch something, don't go and change your password two, three, four times and make people have to come back and ask you for a password. 
they're just gonna forget about it. Like, it's, it's, I, you know, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I was actually recently a programmer for the first time, and there were a couple of passwords. And I, you know, I'm messaging back to say, "What do I do?" And they were like, "Just move on," because we just didn't have the time to track all the filmmakers down and and get it. So, absolutely. I just want to add one thing. Um, what Brenda said just brought up something. Um, I sometimes we're so strapped, we, just, we don't have time to do it, but I think it will really go a long way. If you have the capacity and the bandwidth to do it, try to bring your community along on your journey as, you, as you're going, as you're making a film. Like for example, even like when you apply, you have this big project, you have your script, you have your film ready, you know, the thought is in there and, um, and then you apply for a grant. Let your Facebook community know, hey, I apply for a grant, blah, 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 whatever. And uh, let them know when you get the grant, yeah, I got the grant, like share that news as well. And then when you have your crew ready, let them know, hey, I'm looking for crew members. Do you know somebody ding me? Even if you know your crew already, just keep them in the know. And um, and um, and then once your production starts, let them know, hey, we're on set at this location over here. Today's first day of filming, and all those little pieces, and just move them along through your process, through your journey. And um, if that could be through your personal account, that could be through the account for the for the film project, and that along the way as you're going from stage, from pre-production to production to post-production to publicity and, and distribution later. As you're going through each stage, always have something to share. Maybe it's like, you know, every two months or three months, you pop something out and say, by the way, this is what's happening with the film. This is what, what we're doing, where we're at, and the, you know, the, the journey. Um, for example, I did a project where I had to, to um, garner community support to get votes to vote for my film to get funded and um and i was i was i was out there like asking my community my whatsapp groups you know that's a social media platform you have your contacts on there like in germany and whatever parts of the world right tap into that um let them be a part of your journey and get them involved in your marketing and uh, and, and publicity and create help them help you create that presence for your film uh, to have that social media presence so that later on when a festival is selecting you they they're googling you they're researching you maybe they can see that there's already a community behind this project that you have some you started but yeah definitely don't leave even social media facebook instagram website as much of those as you can plan ahead of time definitely do it i know it's not always easy especially when you don't have a budget for for those professionals to really help you do it and you're one person <laughs> trying to do all those things yeah so you just led right into a question that i had which was about those social media platforms do you need a whole separate page for each different project that you're doing um and do they need to be on all of the platforms is there one that you would maybe recommend over the others um, I think you mentioned like a website, Instagram, Facebook. There is one better um, than the other. <laughs> go ahead. I, for me, I you just I don't necessarily feel that one is better than the other. I just feel like it depends on where your audience is, right? Uh, is your audience on TikTok? Then that's your platform. Is it the Twitter? Then you should definitely tap into that. Uh, for publicity, I know that a lot of reporters are on Twitter um and some of them on facebook um maybe and then it goes lower uh, you know on instagram and TikTok, but definitely on twitter um that's that's a good place for to find public uh, public uh, publicists and uh maybe there's a publicist maybe uh in your region if you're in edmonton or halifax wherever the case may be um you can even start building a relationship with them you can create a uh uh if it's the thing is like, it's easy and fun to create those social media platform. It's the longevity of it and sustaining it that is really important, right? Like <laughs> you, don't want to, you don't want anybody to go, they said, you know, there's no activity. Uh, we're all guilty of it, um, not uh, perfect. I was gonna say, I definitely <laughs> have a couple of like, oh. <laughs> We're all guilty of it because it goes back again when you're, when you're, when the budget is really low, you might not have the person, the manpower to really take care of it. But the key should be that uh, choose a few that you know you can sustain, right? Like you don't need to be everywhere, but if you're going to pick uh, Twitter or, and uh, Facebook, then make sure you do those two platforms very well, right? 
and you have the bandwidth and capacity to create content and post content and reply to comments and questions and and engage, right? Not just post and go, like engage with their community, create that three-way conversation where you're talking to them, they're talking to you, and they're even talking to one another, right? Through your platform. So that's how I like to ideally think a three-way conversation, but you don't always achieve that, but that should be the goal. When you say sustain, is it is it forever or is there kind of a time frame on how long you would need to keep those platforms alive? That's a really great question. Um, it depends on you. If if you're big, again, it goes back to the vision. Like, you know, why are you doing these things you're doing? Like, what is the point? Because the why of things is so important for me. It's like, if I'm writing a post, why am I writing a post? If I'm doing all these activities, because it takes a lot of time and energy to create posts and share them and manage those communities and conversations. So I would suggest go back to your vision. Like, what is your vision? Is it Sundance? Great. If it's Sundance, all right, you're doing all this work, all this legwork for Sundance, the publicity, the marketing, the promotion. Great. And then Sundance happens. I would think like maybe six months, a year after Sundance is done, it's safe. Um, to you, you, you wanted to get into Sundance, you got into Sundance and you got your award, awesome. And six months later, one year later, then I would feel that it's safe to decrease your activity or maybe even, um, I know some filmmakers, they have their main production website and then a film website, and then maybe they redirect from your film website to your production website. And I say, hey, now, if you want to catch us and find out what, what we're doing outside of this film, we can find us over here. So there are different ways you can go about it. But Oh, yeah, that makes and, sense. And, and, it's, and, it, yeah, and it also depends on what life looks like for your film after Sundance, right? Like, it, does you have distribution? Now, did Crave pick it up? Did the, is it on NIB.ca? Is it on CBC Gen? You know, so if, if there are more activities for, for your film afterwards, because you might have one goal, like to get into Sundance, yes. And then maybe after Sundance, like a streaming service saw it, right? It's like, we want your film. And then uh, community organizations are requesting it to, to screen at events and activities. Then if there's life and activities happening for your film, definitely keep that engagement and conversation going. Right. But if not, then feel free, I would feel it's safe to have to right. say that. To Brenda's point, it always needs to be updated. So even if it, that happens less often, as long as it's up to date, that makes sense. Yeah, that would be the key that I would say is if you're going to do more than one um, social media or website, you know, just make sure that they're up to date. Because uh, of course, you know, there's going to be a point where there's not much else to update with, but then at least it's current. Uh, we do get some films um, like uh, was mentioned that do a production website with multiple projects or uh, or uh, dedicated to a particular film. And um, I don't really know that I necessarily have a personal preference. It's about how to find content, you know, and where is the best way to, and the easiest, clearest way to access it. So if we're gonna go to your production website, as long as it's very clear where to see the current film that's on the circuit, or your bio, or again, if it's the film, you know, making sure it's updated. But I, for me, like, I, I would say each festival is also different in how they do things. And uh, if you've got some friends and some following and people who've been paying attention to your project along the way, uh, you know, locally or depending on your, you know, success level, uh, I would also say that picking a the mean, best means in which we could tag you if needed. So, you know, for a, I personally love to follow the filmmakers who are alumni and what their next projects are going to be, or, you know, we become friends with them as a programmer and stay up to date with them. So I would say that, you know, if, you know, for example, Facebook, if we're going to start plugging your film and want to be able to tag you as a person or with your film, whatever the best way to do so, so that we can help reach your audience when we're marketing films and you, that'll also help, you know, spread out that uh, audience and I guess awareness of the film and or films. So 
choosing something where you're, you know, there's no point in having Instagram if you're only going to have five followers, right. you know, so keeping all that in, kind of in mind, where's your reach going to be? So if Facebook is your best reach and that's where you can really invest your time, then that's the one that you can tell the festivals that you've got or, you know, right. kind of. Yeah, I want to ask just one more before we get into the festival questions. Um, in terms of that tagging, is it important to then have a maybe more professional social media presence versus like I know I kind of just have my one slightly more personal um, Instagram. Is there a reason why I sh there should be <laughs> um, one that doesn't have, you know, families and dogs and stuff or... No, if that's your following, then I like, I would say, you know, that, that is just as good as, you know, as some, something related to the film that might not have anyone following you. So it's almost better to have your personal and each festival is different. You know, it's not that, you know, when we're at SIF, we're not always tagging film, uh, people's social media or personals with each post. It kind of depends on, you know, who's leading the charge and marketing that season or that year and each festival is a little different we do it a lot more at cuff but it it kind of depends on on the film and the marketing team so but I, I think it's a really good option to have especially if the programmer is doing their own um promotion of a film on behalf of the festival so i might me as brenda be posting on my personal facebook about some films and filmmakers I'm excited about in the festival and I'm going to tag. So it kind of, you know, it really kind of depends programmer to programmer, festival to festival, but I think just having something that's there that can help spider web your <laughs> exposure of your film, because you often will get a filmmaker if, if you get into a festival. I mean, now we're skipping ahead to you're in a festival, but you know, who, who says, you know, I'd like more people to know about my film being in. And it's like, okay, well, then we all have to work together because there's, you know, 200 films in a festival. Or Yeah, absolutely. It's a, it's like a, it's a two-way street, but mostly it's the filmmaker. <laughs> yes. um, so speaking of festivals, uh, my next question was, how do you devise a, a circuit or a, a strategy, circuit strategy for your film? How do you determine which festivals is right for you? You mentioned earlier about thinking about it being two or three times more than what you'd like it to be, but how do you find that original, original goal? Um... <laughs> I'll go first. I don't know. Um, I think it's, I mean, this is really hard. We get asked this all the time by filmmakers. And then even when I was working on a recent feature, I had the same discussion within the team. But often what we try to recommend is, I mean, for one, I think it's trying to get a really, a lot more clear objective perspective of your film. And realistic so a lot of people think their film is great or the best out of the gate and that <laughs> everyone should apply to tiff and sundance and trebecca and this the biggest festivals in the world to get thousands of submissions wow. and, and i just you know and then they kind of forget about the regional festivals or all the other festivals they miss deadlines they've only put their you know, eggs in all one basket and then they didn't get it and their heart is broken. And, you know, even if you're an alumni at one doesn't mean you're gonna be able to get into that same festival again. So, I mean, like if TIFF brought back every alumni every year, <laughs> like that's impossible, right? It doesn't matter how great your film is. So trying to really look at your film and say, okay, what is the really truly, what is the genre? What is the style of film that my film really truly is? And what are other festivals that have programmed films similar to mine before? So if you're a short filmmaker, you're new or you're experienced, I highly recommend or feature watching other content, go online, watch Vimeo staff picks, watch shorts, 
watch shorts at festivals, see what festivals are programming, see what, you know, find films similar to yours and see what path did they take? Like, not, maybe not by choice, but what, you know, what are some of the festivals that, you know, embraced their content or their style of film? And then, you know, you can look into Film Freeway, which is a really great resource. And you could, you know, look at ones that program experimental film, you know, Asian cinema, female filmmakers, like your LGBTQ, like you're, you're, it's wide open. And then I am a big fan of encouraging filmmakers to consider and not um, overlook look their, the national and regional festivals because you, you know, you spend the money, you apply, you find programmers who get really attached to your film and invite your film. They were passionate about it. They're the ones who are excited about it. They're gonna follow your career. They're gonna talk to other programmers Programmers share screeners, they share contacts, they share filmmakers that they adore. Like there's a whole behind the scenes to what you're doing as a filmmaker in the submission world. Like we're an entire community. So I had no idea. I yeah, don't think so, I realize you talk to I each mean, other. Don't, you know, don't be, be rude or piss people off. Like don't burn your bridges with one and think it's like going to be okay. Like you're, looking at these festivals and premiere status could sometimes weigh on you, but a lot of festivals don't worry about it the same way that the filmmaker did. You know, like we, we looking at shorts, we've had world premieres of shorts at Cuff in April one year that played at Sundance the following year. Like it, there's, there's lots of ways if somebody is interested in your film and passionate about it, you're not going to miss out on your opportunity to screen depending on the type of film you have and the type of festival it is. So I think, I, do, I think do your research, watch films, look at films that yours is truly similar to you, look at the different types of festivals and what they actually accept and make sure you read those guidelines. Cause if you're, right. you know, if you're applying to a festival that, that really, you know, sometimes we'll say we don't accept films between a certain length and somebody says, oh, but mine's two minutes shy. Are you sure? Can you please accept it? All right, we'll take your submission fee. We told you we don't really program it. <laughs> we'll, we'll take it. <laughs> we'll watch it. But like, then don't get mad that we didn't program. It. Like it, you know, you have to look at, anyways, it's just, so I think in terms of a strategy, you have to try to remove yourself from the project a little bit, look at your colleagues around you and try to really have like a, an honest look at your film and see what is like truly, you know, a path that you should take and um, cover those bases is, I mean, it's, that's the best advice I think that I could think of, but it, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, that's really helpful. <laughs> Thank you. If I could add, um, Brenda, you, you said it perfectly. I feel that sometimes filmmakers, we overlook the, the local community festivals, um, but that is also so important when it comes to media as well, right? Um, they meet the, the local media would champion your film like till the end like wow this ha this is happening in Ed in, uh, in in Halifax in Edmonton in Calgary it's about this community I didn't even know this existed and they will they will go to bat for for your film so don't forget because when we end up in, in California at a film festival where the film the production team there's no connection to California there's nothing but there's no ties the local the the local media there they don't care about your film you're from canada where's canada like people might not even know where admission is but if it's screening sf or f or tiff um the local community there and when there are ties especially if you if you're a film producer or maker in edmonton you screen at tiff you have a toronto a toronto connection or one of the production team members is uh, from has a connection to that local community 
um, you, yeah, don't underestimate the connection to local communities. Uh, there are people who even recruit strategically in that way when they're crewing up their production as well. Again, it goes back to what is your vision for your film, right? So uh, yeah, it's really important getting into those uh, local festivals festivals and tapping into the local media and you don't have to wait until your film is ready like after is done to get in touch with the media for example you can befriend you know befriend a, a reporter online and, uh, and and like their stuff and share their stuff and even like feedback them and say hey uh, here's a news tip and they might say, oh yeah, thank you for that. Or, oh, actually I, that was already on my radar. I'm gonna cover it. So I do that all the time. Um, I have public uh, reporter friends that I just kind of like, we go back and forth and bang and, you know, just uh, dinging each other with ideas and stuff like that. And, and half the time it's on their radar or it's not something they're looking for right now and so on and so forth. So just creating a relationship because later on you're gonna be asking something of them, but if beforehand you have a relationship you can actually give, you know, before you ask to be to receive something from them. That would be that would be ideal. Yeah, and that speaks again to thinking ahead of time, <laughs> and really, and really planning. Uh, okay, and like we're, we're all as we're all as programmers. Like, I I should add, like, it's hard for programmers to narrow down the decisions. There's such great content out there, and it it is that you know we shouldn't overlook the fact that like you know, if a filmmaker doesn't get into a festival, it's not necessarily that you've made a film that isn't awesome. It's just, you know, if you, depending on the number of submissions a festival gets and the number of slots that we've got to fill, like it's, it becomes numbers and the programmers, you know, they, they really want to, you're torn between what your audience wants what works with the other content, what the other programmers want, you know, and what you want personally. And you kind of have to balance all of that. Mm -hmm. And you could really get connected with a piece of work that you just know or worry that it might not resonate as well with your audience that attends the festival. So it's like, you know, that's where it's almost like, you know, helpful to try and take a little bit of that step back but I do say like you know that is part of the importance of connecting with your regional and national like festivals and community is because you know when you do get in you or you make a friendship even if you don't get in it does work we're we're trying to work with you in your career too so it might not be this project but it might be your next project and the programmers are looking out for your future and your interests as well. So it's kind of like, you know, just trying to kind of break a bit from that, you know, really like short-sighted, like next step and also looking at it as like a broader thing because it, uh, I think festivals are, and filmmakers and programmers and the whole world, even our, even our local media, like honestly, like our, our, film cover um, journalist for the Calgary Herald is like totally out of his world, amazing. So everyone wants to look out for these filmmakers and help with their careers. So it's um, it's just kind of trying to figure out when the, you know, when the stars are all gonna kind of align per project. And uh, just be careful if you're gonna respond to a festival and say you don't accept their invitation because their festival isn't for you, but yet you applied. And then all of a sudden next year, you want to reapply because you wish you had in the first place. That's mm -hmm. going to be my lesson to tell filmmakers is it's not good. So, mm -hmm. you know, the first time I started working in the film industry and in production and you're kind of, um, you know, I, ha I remember working in production and a prop master one said to me about the bird in the hand versus two in the bush of a, a project that I was debating between. And I thought for some reason that moment in time has stuck with me forever. And I don't, it's not to say, I don't know. I just think that there's something to be said about it. So if you apply to a festival and you, you know, really consider your acceptances, like thoughtfully, if you, um, you know, 
weighing out your strategic plan or rest of the strategy, um, it might not it might not be a bad way to start when you think you're uncertain. Yeah, absolutely. Um, before we, you know, hopefully get accepted to the festival, what are some maybe do's and don'ts about submitting if you don't have a relationship already with with a programmer or with a festival? Well, I definitely think a don't is just don't write the programmer and throw everything about your film in the email and say it's made with two people and you had no budget for submission fees and here's the link and take a look at it anyways, just in case. And then, you know, let me know if we should submit. That's all a no. <laughs> <laughs> everything about that is a no. <laughs> okay, noted, noted. No, I'd like to add, um, it, it, speaking of uh, accepting or not, um, what, it's funny story, Brenda mentioned it earlier, like even if you don't get into one festival, don't feel bad or just continue on because the community, I didn't realize this either, the community does talk to one another. Like for example, I, my film, one of my projects, I had submitted it to a festival and uh, a Canadian festival, but I didn't get in. But then I was, I had plans to submit to the Calgary International Film Fest, right? And I would just, you know, like we all do, we wait to the last minute to submit. And I already had my account on Film Freeway, which is kind of like pushing a button and like, you know, paying the whatever, the fee. And so I'm like waiting for that deadline to approach more and uh, closer. Then I get an email from this film festival that I had submitted to and said I didn't get in, but they recommended my film. And then not so long, the Calgary uh, team uh, approached me and said, hey, uh, we saw uh, somebody over here recommended your film, we would love to screen it. And especially we have this category for, for, for filmmakers that, you know, that fit into your type of film, the, produ um, the, the producer, director, the genre and the community that it's, uh, it's from and, so, and such. So um, those things do happen. Uh, people, they're like reporters as well. They talk to one another. Uh, the festival uh, programming team and communities, uh, they talk to one another as well. That's one thing. So yeah, maintain those relationships. Secondly, um, speaking of film freeway, if you are new to film and you're new to film freeway and be very careful um, about film festivals, Brenda came write a whole book about this, I am sure, or multiple books about this. Um, be careful, be really wary about film festivals that contact you out of the blue and say, hey, please submit. Um, sometimes, I don't know if the, I, I cannot quantify it, but there are film festivals on film for a way that are just money grabbing. They do nothing for your film. They give no publicity, no, no nothing. Like you get not, there's the return on investment is zero. So you won't even get a you, screening. Like you might just get an award and no screening. And what is the quality of that award too, right? It's like, okay. <laughs> um, so be very careful when you get approached, uh, research them, Google them. And be uh, it, for me, um, I will be very wary of film festivals that are international, uh, that come from regions where people can just burn your film on a DVD. And then the next thing you know, it's at a, a, a movie watch outdoor party where they're charging people. You had no awareness about that was happening, but your film has been copied and is being sold at markets in Asia or Africa someplace, right? So be very careful when you do get approached. I got a call from a friend, text message from a friend and I jumped on a call to talk to her. About a week and a half ago, she's like, yeah, this, this film festival from this place called me and they emailed me, they want me to apply, but I, I never heard of them and I didn't even apply. And I don't know where they stopped my film because I'm not on film freeway and, and I'm getting all of this communication. So those things do happen. Be very careful. It's your time, it's your money, it's your project a lot of sweat equity. So be careful where, where you send it. And even if you, um, yeah, just be careful. Even if you thought you wanted to apply to a festival, you looked at it some more and it's really dodgy. Um, and they're asking you for access to your password to download your file. You can't say no. Um, just be very careful. There are a lot of amazing things on Film Freeway, but there are also some really sketchy happenings on there. Yeah, and actually uh, further to that or to build on it, 
you know, I, I get filmmakers asking all the time, have you heard of this festival? Have you heard of that festival? You know, they wanted to play my film, but I'm not sure who they are and I can't find much online or, you know, should I apply? Like, you know, work with your community too. So, you know, if you know the programmer in your city or other festival people in your city, like it's not weird to ask us if, you know, if you need some advice about some of these festivals that you see on, on Film Freeway. I also, um, to your point about do's and don'ts um, or to the question, you know, like back to what I was saying, you know, we're, yes, if a film is recommended and we're given a screener, from another festival, you know, we're, we're possibly gonna be able to fit it in to watch, make time to watch it when it's not submitted. But this is where I go back to like, go do things the proper way because I feel like a lot of filmmakers don't realize that we get hundreds and hundreds of emails that are exactly the same as that example I gave. And some festivals have just started to hit delete. Like they won't respond, they're gonna ignore you. It depends on the staff capacity to even be able to respond to all these emails and the waiver requests, you know, the number of people who say they never thought about, they didn't budget, they didn't, you know, think about the festivals or they spent all their money on the other festivals, but then they got to you. Just think about how that comes across when right. you're the person reading these emails and you're the festival that they now want to get into and it, you know, it's hours upon hours, endless time for all of us to watch content. So, it, you know, we want it to be, meet the guidelines. We want it, you know, we want it to be equal in many ways to other submissions. So I would just recommend uh, consider applying early because, you know, the more you wait to the last deadline, different festivals, different programmers work differently. You may have already started to program a good chunk of your lineup by the time you get to late submissions. So, you know, by the time a late submission comes, depending on the festival or the programmer, you might be saying, oh, I only need a couple coming of age films now. I only need a really hot thriller. I only need, and you know, you have to keep those things in mind because you want the team to be fresh when they're watching your film. You also don't want to submit too early and submit a rough cut and then have to submit three or four other versions before the end because the programmer may not have time to rewatch your film. Mm -hmm. So balancing the stage in which your film is completed and the deadlines so that you, the programming team is watching your film with the best possible lens in the time frame that has gives the best opportunity for your film to get accepted would be some definite dues. And then definitely if you've ever been accepted to a festival, that's when you could re reach out to a festival and ask if there's a waiver for alumni. Almost every festival gives oh, alumni. Okay. And some it's only the director, but some it's the producer or anyone on the team. So, you know, if you got a team put together for your film, that is a really good resource to have because it'll save you some dollars. Yeah, that's a really great because I feel like I do hear about this the secret waiver thing, <laughs> but it's good to know that that's more in the scenario where you've already played there or they know a little bit more about who you are, who someone on your team is. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah, or if you're regional, you know, like we give right. waivers to uh alumni we give waivers to alberta uh often like discounts for students uh depending each festival is different again whether it's a waiver or a discount but you know and i get i a, a don't would be don't apply to a cheaper category that your film it doesn't fit into just because you want to like mess with the system yeah you're gonna get busted like it doesn't <laughs> look good if you say you're a canadian film and the canadian pricing is different and international your film is clearly not a canadian film like <laughs> i'm sorry but like <laughs> very fair very fair um well i guess this kind of ties in um i'm very sorry to say we've got to start wrapping this up i have 
so many more questions that I didn't even get to, but I think we did a, a good overview and we touched on a lot of things. Uh, so I guess my last question is, you you know you've created your strategy you've submitted to your festivals you haven't broken any of the rules or been particularly rude you've managed to get into the festival um what what's what then is it important for you to to be part of the festival do you hopefully if things ever go back to in person what what does that process look like uh well I definitely think it's important to be part of the festival. If you get into it, I think if you get in, um, find, you know, and this maybe goes back to the budget originally, but mm -hmm. think about what you could do to attend the festivals when we're in person. Uh, it is such good networking between the filmmaker and the other filmmakers, filmmaker and audience and then filmmaker and programmer. So you're looking at it all. And uh, I, I think it's really great for you to build that connection uh, with, you know, in, in each category and see how your film works on screen, you know, and, you know, see what audiences think of it. It's just so different than than anything else you can experience. So I highly recommend it. I know that especially shorts, like features, you know, they, they, they get kind of separated sometimes shorts and features and you have to find the shorts programmers, like really like, come on shorts <laughs> filmmakers, you on my team and the features the same, but it's really like, you know, we love getting to know the shorts filmmakers. They're in a different world as well and they're so excited to meet each other and meet the staff and we get excited to meet them and see where their career is going to go and how many festivals end up showing the first features of the shorts filmmakers that they've shown at their festival before and alumni it's it's exciting to watch the progression of their career and then for the features it's um you know, same and same and different. So we love to build these relationships and I think it's an important part of your festival planning and trajectory. And then you can, you know, hopefully get that waiver for the next film yeah. <laughs> with, yeah. that, with yeah. that connection. And in terms of the, the press side of things or the media side of things, once you get to the festival, is that kind of, you know, job done or or is there more? No, that's where it really begins, right? Now you have to say something. Um, it can go, once you get into a festival, it can go two ways, right? So sometimes with festivals, they have their own publicists, like the SIF does, right? Uh, who's going to organize everything for you. If there's, if there's any media opportunity and say, hey, CTV wants to, uh, we have an interview scheduled with the CTV at this day, at this time, are you available? If that doesn't work for you, what are the other dates are available and so on and so forth. Or it could end, or it could be that um, you are at the event and there are reporters like, you know, roaming around and one like pulls you to the side, not physically, but like there's a mic in your face. Like, so what, Phil, what is your project? And, you know, they get you right then uh, there on the spot and you have to respond, right? So those are the two scenarios that how it could go. Uh, for the first version, you have time to plan and prepare, right? So uh, get your interview, uh, just anticipate some questions, you know, you'll be asked during the interview. But also to not just cater into the reporter and what they're going to ask, but what are some key messages that you want to deliver? What do you want to say and tell the audience about your film as well? So practice, 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 practice not to memorize, but just to feel comfortable, like saying those mm -hmm. words and hearing them come out, come out of your mouth and feeling all of that in your body and your tone, your the way you, um, uh, all of that stuff, just practice. You practice in front of the mirror, call a friend and say, hey, Jenny, uh, I have a media, media interview tomorrow. Can I run a few lines by you? Can you ask me this prompt question, whatever. Uh, so practice before your media interview and even before you go to the festival because that mic might just come <laughs> right in your face. 
<laughs> and when that does happen, uh, you're ready. You have your key messages that you want to say, and you're also equipped to be able to answer the reporter's question. In either case that you don't have a, a response, you don't have the answer, don't feel obligated that you have to like say something. Um, you don't have to say something. You do have a level of control over a conversation with the reporter, even if they're recording you to type up an article later or you're live or it's pre-recorded. Um, so if you don't know something, for example, say, actually, I don't know the answer to that right now. I don't have that answer. Can I get back to you at a later date? And um, they'll give you a deadline and you get back to them, right? Um, and the other thing too is uh, avoid uh, saying, uh, oh, oh, like I have been saying uh, ridiculously so. But if you can avoid those, uh, those words, um, that would be helpful in your conversation as well. Just do your best to prepare, like in, if you can, like for example, in that first scenario, you know that it's with CTV, maybe CTV Morning Live, right? So you can go back and watch some pre-recorded, some previous shows, or maybe your interview is like three days away, then watch one episode to see how people conduct themselves when they go on there, the kind of questions the reporter asks or the host asks, um, the kind of uh, just how the show runs, not to make you feel uncomfortable, to psych you out, to stress you out, but to make you put you at ease. When you do go on the show, you're sitting there and in that seat with across from the from the host, so you already know visualization, right? So you already know what it looks like and what how the relationship can go. So little little things like that. That's great. I think that would have uh, saved me a couple of very awkward interviews. <laughs> that advice. Um, thank you both so oh, much. Sorry, thing? do you have? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I was going to build on it. I know. One more minute. Sorry. Um, <laughs> when you go to these festivals, a lot of filmmakers actually will will you go a couple days before and help spread the word of mouth about their film mm -hmm. on the ground. So, you know, that's something to consider because, you know, again, it's helping to fill butts and seats. Uh, some festivals will give you a few comps to your screening. So if you don't know somebody to give them to, you know, you go out, you have a coffee, you meet some whatever like just keep in mind that you know help the team to market your film and we sometimes get some really quiet introverted nothing wrong like really shy filmmakers some will choose to bring somebody from the film with them so a writer or a producer so they can kind of feel a little bit more comfortable as a team um so anyways just a couple of tips of extra and i just want to say two things before we wrap <laughs> Sorry, i know i know i know First thing, first thing, when you are in an interview with a reporter, they're recording you to type up an article later, if it's live, if it's any situation, uh, don't feel that you have to feel the silence if there is silence. Um, don't feel that you have to say something because innately, naturally, as human beings, we're like, oh, this is awkward. I have to say something. Um, don't feel the need to say something sometimes. It might just be that the, the reporter is typing notes, they're writing stuff down, or they're, you know, processing their thoughts to ask you the next question. So let the silence be. And oftentimes, too, the reporter, that's their job. They know how to smooth out the conversation and like segue from question to question and so on and so forth. So don't feel obligated that you must say something when there's silence. And secondly, um, secondly, when you are in conversation, when you're pitching the media, make sure you have one contact information, like there's one way, one person, like, again, simplicity does it. They don't have the time to be chasing you around to trying to get this and that from over there and over here. It's make sure it's one person interacting with them, maybe it's you. It's one, the same email address, the same phone number. If you're sharing any documents with them, share it always from the same space. If it's Google Drive, it's a Google Drive, that folder link that you've already sent them before. Continue to dump whatever in there if you're missing anything that you need to, you need to send them later. John, have John and Cindy and Sally interact um, with the media. Have one person, one point of contact. John and Cindy and, and Sally. That. That's great. That's I what we have time for. <laughs> That's, there's there's a more, but that's a media, media, media relations conversation, I think, that, that you would be really great for. Um, 
Okay, thank you so much. I feel like the big takeaways, you know, uh, being intentional, really thinking, making a plan, starting early, not being rude, listening to the rules. Um, thank you so much. There, there's so much to uh, learn from that. Uh, I, that's definitely all the time we have. Um, so thank you again. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, thank you.